This is electric. Sometimes I use a kick wheel, which is manual. But this makes it a little bit easier. Now what I'm doing here is just making shorter the clay right in the middle. Centering is the hardest part of the pottery making process. So you want to make sure that all the clay molecules are lined up, which makes it easier to have plasticity to the clay, as well as it compacts the clay in such a way that it won't allow for cracks as it receives water. Plus, you can't spin clay without falling apart if you don't have the clay completely centered. Go ahead and comment where you're from. So I know who's with me today. So the centering process is pretty boring for most, but it is pretty technical. Uh, how you center is by moving the clay mass both up and down. So as you can tell, and then you take the palm of your hand along with the bottom of or, or your two uh, pinky fingers, you raise up the clay into like a soup can. And you do this until it has very little wobble in the clay. So good about centering as well. Not only does it become more stable for you to work with, but it actually allows for some of the air bubbles that get trapped within the clay during the process uh, outside to come onto the potter's uh, kiln, kiln <laughs> wheel and actually drive some of that air bubbles out of the clay. You might even hear some pops because it's forcing that clay into the very center of the mass. And air bubbles, if you're familiar with pottery, is ab absolutely dangerous to the pottery process. In fact, if you heat up a pot with the air bubble, it will actually create steam and it will actually bust the piece of pottery. Okay, so here I have it relatively centered and it is ready to be brought up. Now, if I want to do a bowl, I'll go back to that tuna can kind of squat. And if I want to make more of a cylinder, like a vase, I'm going to start with the clay mass in like a soup can fashion. Sometimes I like just to do the in between. Now this right here, a lot of a lot of the beginners will uh, take this substance completely off, um, but it's actually the most beneficial thing to the potter because there's a lot of friction between the potter's hands and the clay itself, and you want to have constant lubrication. Now what's so great about this is actually what liquidized clay isn't it and it causes it's like oil it doesn't easily absorb so it creates a constant flow of liquid okay so i feel pretty confident that this is nice and centered centering takes a good five years to learn Okay, now I'm going to support the clay mass at all times on the outside because right now all the force of the mass wants to go on the outside pressing into my hand. So I'm going to go ahead and keep it 
I'm going to insert one finger slowly. Now this is going to be a bowl, so I'm going to allow my finger to kind of create more of an outside wall. And for the bottom, I'm going to allow at least a quarter inch of clay so I can compact the bottom. If you don't compact the bottom, we'll get what's called an S crack. And that reveals that the potter did not compact the clay, did not get the molecules at the bottom of the clay mass all in a line. It's pretty weird stuff, but that's what happens. I like to work with a natural sponge. It's called an elephant ear. And these are sustainable, farmed. So go ahead and I have my uh, bottom. And what's so great about pottery is us potters, we uh, describe the pot in terms of human anatomy. And this is actually called the foot. What we do is make the body, and the very top ridge is actually called the lip. Now, if the lip is not completely what, straight or level, the lip will actually throw the whole mass of the pot out. So you want to make sure that the lip is really nice and tight and even. And then the object of the game, if you will, is to take the, the center of uh, your clay bottom pull up in three pulls to get the height of your pot any more pulls than that is going to really weaken the clay because more that you touch more that you um, water that you add more the the clay becomes really fragile and higher you go, slower you want to turn the wheel. Now I have a little foot pedal right here that allows me to adjust the speed. I'm going to go ahead and cut the lip. Now this is a uh, clay that's quite wet, so you have to be a little bit more cautious with it. Now I'm going to make a, a, a bit of a... a um, a splaying vase, so I'm not going to do it in three pulls. Is enough fun. Here we go. Let me know, have you ever tried pottery? Whether it be as a kid or in high school. Now this tool is called a potter's rib. And we used to use animal ribs. And what it does, it provides a strong, strong edge to force the clay in a uniform type of shape. As you can tell, this is more level now. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the edge, the top edge, and just slowly pour it into the edge of that rib. And it actually takes on that outside form. I'm going to take this off the wheel for you. I'll show you the shape. Right now, it looks pretty weird looking almost straight down from it. So here you go. There we go. So that's a nice type of vase. And what I'm going to do for us is do something that I always like to do, even as a kid when I was self-teaching um, myself, is what's called a frilling. 
It is a legit potter's t term used in the 1800s. And frilling is nothing but taking the finger, pushing it between your index and your thumb, and creating almost like a flower-like edge. And all what I'm doing is pressing very gently as if I'm a kid picking up a lizard. And it creates a nice, nice frill. Isn't that beautiful? It looks so simple, isn't it? But it takes some time to learn such things. Look at how uniform that is. I love it. And you have the kind of the, the finger imprints on there. So you know that it's been handmade. Some people kind of like to take those uh, rings off. But how, how weird if you want to have a good, well-made piece of handcrafted pottery. Again, I'm going to take my two pounds of clay to make sure that the bat is not too wet or else the clay will slide around. Okay. And you want to smack it on there because you don't want it's with my palms is I'm just making sure that the majority of the mass is right on the center. And then I go into a more faster spin. Soup can tuna can. Lifting up the mass into the soup can, lowering the mass into a tuna can. And that is centering clay in just a phrase. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but I have to make sure that my elbows is planted firmly into my thighs. Because if I have them up here, guess what? That clay is going to telegraph any wobble into the outside here. And it's going to teach me how to conform. And I need to teach it how to conform. Soup can, twenty can. Depends on how soft, how hard the clay is. If it's more plastic and wet, you can center an amount, uh, a matter of no time. So as you can see, there's really no wobble in that. It's almost like wood on a lathe. Let's go ahead and clean up my bat. Get ready. Now I want to make uh, a regular type of vase. So a tall vase with a very long foot and a small body. So I go ahead with a very tall soup can profile. Go ahead and enter the clay mass. Go straight down. You don't want to splay out too much of the clay mass on the cylinder just yet. Remember, a quarter inch from the bottom. Make sure that bottom is well compacted to avoid any S cracks from not getting the clay molecules all lined up in their cube. Now, as you can see, there's a little bit of a foot that I made with my thumb, and now I'm going to pull up the mass from that ridge. Remember, three pulls. Slow up my speed as I go up. Because as you go up, you're pulling more mass up higher, and that's going to really want to lay out on us. That's one pull.
that's your two pulls. Uh, almost there. Really, usually it's about the three pull that you start to really take the clay mass and really teach it where to go to form. And where is my pottery rib? This happens to me all the time. You lose tools in your uh, wash bucket or a water bucket. I couldn't go ahead and tell the piece be more cylindrical so it's a little bit easier to work with form a shape okay and now my third my third pool will be actually forming make sure that I have plenty of water and here we go. So I have it's called a belly or a chest. Remember, pottery is the pot itself is described in terms of human anatomy. Make sure that lip is not going to throw off the piece. So I'm going to go ahead and cut that. Just, ooh. And that's what happens when the clay is a bit too wet. It tends to just kind of go limp on you. And normally I'm able to just kind of fling it right off into the bucket. Boy, what a mess. Okay, here we go. Now I'm gonna put more pressure on the neck to create a taller neck. I'm gonna push the foot in a little bit more. My vases are known for small feet, um, more narrow. Bottoms in a quite round chest on the pot. And what I'm going to do is just put a little bit of a stubby neck on it. And how I finish off the lip of the pot is just with some, you can do this with a piece of, of bag, but I do it with some cloth. And I just smooth and polish out that lip. You don't want to have any water on the bottom of the pot, so you can go ahead and stick a sponge on a stick down in the base. And there you have it. Now, what I like to do is it's called the pencil trick because uh, normally you can have a pencil and do this. I actually have a, a good tool to the point, and I'm going to cut on the diagonal on the foot just to get some access, excess clay off that foot, which allows me to take a wire later on, cut off the bat. And then it will reveal a cleaner foot. Okay, I'm going to show you guys what I mean. And here we go. A fresh pot has been born. Isn't that neat? So yeah, cut a little bit of a foot. It's a little bit cleaner. Remember, I did this in three pulls. It's a lot harder than what it looks. Okay, let me put this down. Let's see who is with us this Sunday afternoon. All right. And this will be recorded and published. I'm sure that a lot more of us will see it then. 
little bit of moisture. So now what am I going to make? Well, the next mud baby is going to be an elegant mole. And it's uh, amazing how much, or how tall, how big of a vessel you can make with just two pounds of clay. Tuna can, soup can. Has there been times that the clay has forced itself out of my hands and actually rolled all over the place? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it actually flings outside of the wheel itself, and that's when you really know you got problems. All right. So I'm going to start off with... Uh, Tuna can size since we're doing a bowl. It gives it a larger base. Center down on the RV to create that cavity to pull out from. See, I always have to hold my hands together to make sure that it's supported. It helps me not to move too violently too quick because the clay is very impressionable. And if you have any questions, go ahead and comment. There's some things about the pottery process that I take for granted. And it might be good to know what you think. Go ahead and clean up the bottom of the pot. What you want to do is leave more of the center mass or, or the mass of the clay towards the bottom because the walls are going to get thin on the outside and it's going to pull out and it needs a good firm, firm thick wall on the bottom and it makes the pot itself once it's fired and completed really durable it's really hard to break and it's dishwasher safe pull that out carefully with bowls sometimes you can only get a pull a pull and a half sometimes two because it partly does the work for you in regards to pulling out with elasticity when you're pulling out that center mass. Plus, you don't want to touch it too much because it is fragile. Now, remember, this is just the beginning of pots. Life. Once this dries out, it becomes uh, what we're called the stage of leather hardness, and it sounds exactly what <laughs> is experienced. It becomes almost leather hard. You might be able to just tap a little bit. It might move a little bit, but that's a good place to start to trim off your, the bottoms, uh, make a foot or feet on the bottoms, uh, go home, overturn uh, a bowl that you have, and you're going to see like a bottom rim or a foot. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And I take several different tools and I carve that out by hand. So it has less to wobble on any surface. Now this is pretty wide and it's pretty narrow on the bottom. So what I want to go ahead and do is fill out the bowl, putting a little bit of pressure at the same time pushing out with the rim pushing in. 
Now this is kind of good for like displaying fruits. You can uh, also put like green beans. It's kind of accessible to get any contents out of this bowl. Go ahead and do my foot. Inserting a piece of wood on an angle. And I'm going to peel off the clay that I just put away. And I'm going to put water in between the two. You'll see what I mean. So it doesn't stick. When I see just like that. So does it stick to the other clay? Because it really is sticky stuff. You know, if I want to insert or uh, do an incision and pull that clay out of my way, you make sure that it's completely lubricated. So that's extra clay that was on the bottom that I have now carved away. I used to do like really tiny bottoms on the pieces. But I have realized that probably wider is a lot better. You can fit more into a pot that has a wider bottom. It says better shape for stability. There we go. I'm going to leave this one a little bit different than what I normally do. Normally, I will create more tension in the rim by folding the edge of the rim a little bit inside to create some good tension, especially when it's glazed in just a perfect sense. Pull this off. And there you are. So I've left on the side here uh, my soap dish. They just came out a week and a half ago. Uh, they have new glazes that have never been shown, never have been sold before. They're limited edition blue jean glaze. Uh, they are my signature matte or semi-matte orange pill uh, glaze, which means it's really easy to clean and it's pretty elegant you can't buy the orange peel glaze anywhere else so these are all what i have made this afternoon all right here and it has taken 10 years of my life to get this far and making the pottery process a really a faster one as well as a less of a painful process. And there's no hard fast rules to pottery making um, in regards to some, some of the styles of, of forming the pot, the, the process of picking up the pot. It's still the same principles, but everyone has a different form because we have different styles, different functions different styles of the pot so i hope that you enjoyed this make sure that you share with friends and take a look at what i have especially these soap dishes that i have made just for marketplace thank you so much